Okay, let's assume that we're in a situation where the Democrats retain control over the Senate. Uh, Republicans control the House by a couple of votes. What, what, what then? The legislative agenda is over, right, at that point. Um, and, you know, I guess there's some fights to be had in, uh, in, the, uh, in the lame duck in terms of what they do with the debt ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. But what then? What does your organization do? A, obviously, you, you continue to recruit uh, candidates who are progressive. But what, what's, the, what, what's the theory then in terms of like, you know, what Biden should be doing? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our staff meeting this morning. Uh, well, we'll see. Um, you know, our through line the last two and a half years really has been keep the trains of democracy on track. Um, that's why this, this cycle, unlike any other cycle, we were all in on Secretary of State races. And I do think we need to, you know, look at the 2024 race, see is Donald Trump running or favored to win and assess our Democratic nominee. The answer is yes. Well, we'll see. I mean, there might, there might be uh, a gut check after last night's election. I mean, there's... Yeah. Dude, seriously? There, I, I mean... We, how many times have we said the Republicans are really going to take a look at themselves? Yeah. I mean, they're they're, they're, they're they're all pretending that no. they can get rid of uh, Donald Trump. But the fact is, no, they're going to fold like like a like a like a, like a house of cards. The moment Ron DeSantis has to actually go head to head yes. with Donald Trump, it is over. Like, are you seeing just really quickly these think pieces this morning about how big, big night for DeSantis? I mean, he did win, but he was running against Charlie Chris. So, um, but like, it, like huge win for DeSantis, massive losses for Trump. As if the candidates that Trump supports, the election deniers or whatever, are in any way indicative of how he'll perform when it's a Republican primary he's, and he's the real deal on stage. He's never been good. It's at, just they're trying to will, will it into existence. I mean, we, if we have this conversation next Wednesday, the day after he has announced, it, there's going to be no, no, like there's going to be none of this. I mean, this is like it, this. We are at peak DeSantis power right yes. now. This is peak DeSantis power. Okay. It is the day I, I after managed, he's I managed to knock this conversation off with a sentence fragment. Sorry about that. Okay. Wasn't my prime point. My prime point was, okay. Sorry. you know, we, we need to think seriously about 2024 and who has the best chance in 2024 of saving our democracy. Um, not just, well, starting with winning the presidential race, but also setting the tone for the entire landscape that will motivate voters again to actually show up so we don't lose democracy then. I think, again, we have a two-year lease on life. That is one big consideration that's looming in the background before we get to the policy. When we get to the policy, you know, we, we've been very encouraging of the White House and others picking a big fight with Republicans if they take the House majority on Social Security. You know, again, it worries me a lot that gas prices were the most tangible economic thing in people's lives recently. And a lot of this good stuff that we just passed has not taken effect yet. Social security is another tangible thing in people's lives. And similar, similar to the Obamacare fight, um, Americans don't want it taken away. And Mitch McConnell and others have signaled that, that they don't want to be playing on that turf, but too many Republicans have taken the bait and showed their true cards that they want to cut social security. So I think that that would be, if our goal is to you know pick a fight quickly that Democrats can unify on, but that is on progressive grounds, and just sets up the terms of debate for the lame duck Congress and for the next two years, I think starting with Social Security would be a really smart move by, by the White House. What that also does is it has ripple effects. Right how do now, they do that? Like, what, how do they, they, do they put up a bill to say expand Social Security? Is that, I mean, how, how do they do that? So I, I think literally, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this. Literally, Joe Biden would start by giving a speech saying, um, you know, let's be clear, Social Security and Medicare cuts should be off the table. I want to hear Kevin McCarthy or Republican leadership say that today, right? Send the whole press corps back to him. Um, have a few other Republicans squeal and say, oh my gosh, why is why is Joe Biden saying this? But yeah, Joe Biden should say, if anything, we should be expanding benefits to keep up with rising costs of our seniors. And I will say that we just, this, this past week, we took the rare step of commissioning two different pollsters to poll people for whom inflation was their top concern and then I asked them, here's a set of things people think should be done to deal with rising costs. Which of these do you support and oppose? 
cutting Social Security benefits was like 20 to 1 against among inflation voters. Increasing benefits for Social Security was like 15 to 1, yes, please. Um, you know, taking on corporate price gouging was something like 10 or 15 to 1, right? So that's a really solid turf for us to be on. You know, cutting food stamps, hell no, right? But the Joe Manchins of the world, their instinct, and he signaled this this past week, is to go back to austerity. And my question is, you know, there's, you know, this is going really in the weeds, but if we do not increase the debt ceiling during the lame duck while we have power, assuming we don't, we don't keep it for the next Congress, that is setting up a giant fight around next August where Republicans will have extreme leverage and try to use it to cut, whether it's food stamps or education. Social Security. Right. Oh, yeah. That's not uh, terribly weedy. We've, we've, we've probably, we probably talked about that, I don't know, uh, ad nauseum this week. Right. So working backwards, if Joe Manchin, if the question before Joe Manchin and the people like Mark Warner is, should we raise the debt ceiling $3 trillion uh, just to get this fight out of the way? And it's just about wonky financial terms. Well, Joe Manchin's going to say, I can't explain. I can't explain this in West Virginia. We got to get our spending under, under control. But if we pick a fight like tomorrow on Social Security, and it's clear that the debt ceiling fight is a proxy in a good way for the debt for for the Social Security fight, then the question for Joe Manchin is, can you go home and defend the fact that you're saving Social Security? There's right. a lot of older people in West Virginia. So honestly, I think that's where we start. And that just starts an entire ripple effect and chain of events, right? If we go the wrong way on that debt ceiling conversation, we're going the wrong way on a lot of policy issues. And there's too much oxygen in the room for the Joe Manchin types. If we relieve the pressure and you know can pick smart fights on our terms, then Americans who currently think Republicans absurdly are better on economics start realizing, oh, we're the ones fighting for workers. So I really think it, start, it all begins with picking a smart fight and that puts oxygen in the room for winning future fights or at least winning the public relations battle.